Let me welcome you to the 2020 Drivesdale Lecture. To those here in the chapel at NTC and to those around the country um, and beyond um, who are listening and watching through live stream. In 1916, Scottish evangelist John Douglas Drysdale settled in Birkenhead and gathered around him a following which soon became known as Emmanuel Church in Clotten Road. His fervent preaching challenged many young people to be trained in reaching out to the needs of people across the world. Emmanuel Bible College began training missionaries on November the 11th, 1920 with three students. In 1997, Emmanuel Bible College Birkenhead ceased operation and became an integral part of NTC. And in 2004, the Emmanuel Center, a new library and classroom unit, was opened to mark that transition. The mission interests of EBC were carried at NTC, first by the Emmanuel Center for Mission Study, and then the Center for Evangelism and Church Development. The Drysdale Lecture began in 1998 and is designed to allow an opportunity for critical reflection on key areas in contemporary missiology. As a friend and colleague, it's a particularly personal joy to welcome Stuart Mary Williams um, to this college and to give this lecture. After obtaining law, a law degree from London University, Stuart Murray Williams spent 12 years planting and leading a multi-ethnic church in East London. He then spent the next three years obtaining a PhD in church history and hermeneutics. From 1992 to 2000, Stuart was a lecturer at Spurgeon's College London, where he directed the church planting and evangelism course and developed master's programs in both urban mission and radical church history. During this time, he founded a mission agency, Urban Expression, and was also one of the founders of the Anabaptist Network in 1992. Since 2000, Stuart has been a self-employed trainer, lecturer, consultant, and writer, operating under the auspices of the Anabaptist Network. In 2004, he co-founded the Crucible course to train pioneers in a post-Christism context. He currently supervises and examines MTH, DMIN, and PhD students, and lectures at various universities and theological colleges. Almost got the PhD out there. Stuart lives in Canterbury, Kent with his wife, Sean, and a Baptist minister. He has two grown sons and three grandchildren. The title of tonight's lecture is called Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. As a minority community in a post-Christian society, what is the missional vocation of the church? What can we learn from the prophet Jeremiah's counsel to the Israelite exiles in Babylon? Stuart, you're warmly welcome here, and it's a great honor and privilege to have you to deliver this lecture, and we invite you to come to do so. Let's show our warmth and welcome. Thank you. I've uh, known Trevor quite a long time, and I'm never quite sure what he's going to say, so I think I've got a fairly like you this evening. I won't push it. The invitation to give this lecture was accompanied by a request for a title and a synopsis. I'm sure you recognize the biblical source of the title. The poignant cry of Israelite exiles in Psalm 137. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Acknowledging my debt to the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, I suggest that the Old Testament exilic literature offers some helpful insights and resources as we reflect on the first question in the synopsis, the one that Trevor's already read to us. As a minority community in a post-Christendom society, what is the missional vocation of the church? How can we sing the Lord's song in this new and challenging environment? A few words first on two phrases in the question. 
post-Christendom society and minority community. The term post-Christendom has become increasingly familiar in recent years, although it's still sometimes confused with other post-terms, in particular post-modern and post-colonial, which are connected but are certainly not identical. Nor is post-Christendom the same as post-Christian, which begs at least two questions. How Christian actually was the Christendom era? And might the demise of this sacral society in which the church colluded with power, wealth, status, and violence offer us an opportunity to recover a more authentic expression of Christian faith? Post-Christendom might be more rather than less Christian. I continue to advocate a rather cumbersome definition of post-Christendom that appeared in my 2004 book with the same title. Post-Christendom is the culture that emerges as the Christian faith loses coherence within a society that has been definitively shaped by the Christian story and as the institutions that have been developed to express Christian convictions decline in influence. Paul wrote long sentences in the New Testament. That's my only defense for that rather cumbersome one. And I remain convinced that the gradual transition from one era to another represents huge challenges, but also great opportunities for the Christian community in Western societies. Let me suggest five features of this emerging culture that I believe are significant as we try to discern our missional vocation within it. First of all, it really is new. We haven't encountered this before in the history of the global church. I recognize that's quite a claim to make. It is different from Christendom and it's different from pre-Christendom. It's different from contexts in which the gospel has taken root and flourished without state support or the church attaining majority status. It is different from those contexts in which another religion has replaced Christianity and become dominant. It is different and presents different challenges. Secondly, it is deeply skeptical of the institutional church and unimpressed by our history, our belief systems, our ethical standards, our evangelistic antics, our publicity, and our attitudes on all kinds of issues. We face an uphill struggle to get a hearing for the gospel in the light of the compromises of the Christendom era. We have quite a legacy to live down. Third, it is by no means as secular as it is sometimes claimed to be. Some influential elements of society are indeed aggressively secular, especially in education and the media. But at the grassroots, all kinds of spiritualities are flourishing. Questions about the meaning of life haven't disappeared. And there are many reasons to describe much of our context as post-secular. Yet another of these post-words. Fourth, it is increasingly ignorance of the biblical story. Rather than being shocked by this or despairing, we might greet this as a remarkable opportunity. For the first time in many centuries in Western societies, we can tell the story to people who've never heard it and for whom it is news. We no longer have to try to persuade people to take interest in something they think they've heard before. And fifth, it is a missionary context and we will need to think like cross-cultural missionaries. And that's so not only in relation to other religious or ethnic communities, but in relation to most people in our society. But few of our churches or denominations currently think like missionaries. And many pioneers fail to ask the necessary questions about how to incarnate the gospel in the many subcultures in our society. I am concerned that many of us are responding to post-Christendom strategically rather than missiologically, pragmatically rather than theologically. Evangelistic methods that used to work are no longer effective, so we need new ones. Forms of church that were suitable for centuries no longer attract a whole people, so we need fresh expressions of church. Ways of nurturing discipleship that were adequate before no longer sustain us, so we need some new programs. 
I don't think those responses are adequate. I suggest we need to be alert to a number of dangers in this situation. First of all, pragmatism. Desperately hunting for something that works and looking for a quick fix solution, a plug in and play program that will relieve our anxieties. It's a desperation that drives pragmatism. Secondly, dogmatism. Insisting that our approach, our response, our program, our way of engaging with the emerging context is the only legitimate one. Thirdly, superficiality, the triumph of style over substance, pop sociology, following cultural trends without proper analysis, innovation without contextualization. Simply serving donuts will not change the church. Fourthly, iconoclasm. Arrogantly dismissing historical approaches to discipleship, mission, and church without reflecting on their strengths as well as their weaknesses. There's a temptation to sweep everything away as if that legacy has nothing to teach us. And fifthly, eclecticism. What I mean by that is romanticizing preferred traditions or ripping elements out of traditions without understanding their context or the foundations on which they were built. A kind of pick and mix postmodern way of dealing with our past, which often doesn't exist. I think those are dangers. Instead, I suggest that we need an approach that has four features. First of all, provisional. In a time of transition and a time of changing culture and in a complex culture, we need to explore things that are genuinely exploratory, that are flexible, that are not too fixed. We have many more questions than answers and that's entirely appropriate at present. Secondly, respectful of our past and of each other as we respond to the challenges we face. This is not a time for silos or competition. We need each other. We need the insights that we can bring to each other and the insights from our past. Thirdly, discerning. Discerning of our cultural context and of what to adopt and adapt from the past. Not all of it needs to come with us. There's baggage to lay down but there are treasures from the past that we need to bring with us. And fourthly, reflective, resisting impatience and engaging in careful theological reflection. There is a drivenness sometimes about the urgency that we feel, which needs to be resisted. <coughs> so much for that word post-Christendom, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you. And we face the challenges of post-Christendom as a minority community. It seems that this will be the status of the church in most Western societies for the foreseeable future. Now, minority status has been the experience of many Christians through the centuries and in many societies. From the early churches in the first three centuries of the Roman Empire, through the churches in Asia for many centuries, to the emerging churches in the global south, some of which might be heading towards majority status. So there's nothing unusual about Christians being a minority community. But we Christians in the West are heirs of Christendom, 15 centuries in which the church enjoyed majority status. We are an ex-majority minority, and that's very different. The Christendom legacy makes adjusting to minority status problematic. Some of the problems are physical, financial, legal, and logistical. Huge buildings that are expensive to maintain cumbersome hierarchies and bureaucracies, legal obligations and civic duties, attempting to be present in all communities and so on. Other problems are related to expectations and assumptions, programs that are increasingly unsustainable and burning out our members. If you ask why so many people are leaving the church, evidence suggests we're burning them out, trying to sustain the unsustainable. Traditions that were designed for a different era. Ecclesial practices that are justified on dubious theological grounds, but were rooted in sociological realities that no longer exist. Expectations of privilege, preferential treatment, and the right to be listened to, and so on. And some problems are the results of ways in which we Christians have reacted to minority status. Continuing to think and speak 
as if we were still in the majority, hankering after lost status, clinging on to inappropriate privileges, becoming grumpy, resentful, or belligerent, losing faith and hope, and so on. And there are theological issues here. How do we interpret the demise of Christendom and the transition from majority to minority status? Does this mean that the church has failed in its mission to Western culture? Is the church under judgment? Or is it the Christendom collusion with power, wealth, status, and violence that's under judgment? Does our situation shake our faith in God or the gospel or the church? What is God doing or not doing with us? How do we pray? What songs do we sing? What are we hoping for? Adjusting to minority status will not be easy, but it gives us an opportunity to rethink many issues, to look again at the biblical sources, to revisit the connections and disconnections between gospel and culture, to rediscover our calling as a pilgrim people, and to engage in contextualization in a complex and changing culture. We are now a minority community, albeit one with vast resources and opportunities, facing the question, what kind of minority do we want to be? Can the exilic literature help us to discern some ways forward? And in particular, what can we learn from the prophet Jeremiah's counsel to the Israelite exiles in Babylon? That was the introduction. Let's now look at the exilic literature itself. Back to Psalm 137 first. Israelite exiles in Babylon in the 6th century BC have been taunted by their captors, tormented with jibes about their distant and unreachable homeland, urged to sing a song of Zion. Come on, sing us one of your happy, clappy Zion choruses. This treatment provokes an outpouring of emotion. It's a difficult psalm. Grief and self-pity as they ponder their forlorn situation. Resentment at being asked to sing for their tormentors. Yearning for Jerusalem. And violent anger against the Babylonians who destroyed their city and the Edomites who rejoiced at its fall. The last verse is rarely included in public readings of the psalm as it pronounces a blessing on any who take vengeance on their enemies by kidnapping and murdering their children. The exiles are disoriented, miserable, and ready to lash out at anyone who be held responsible for their plight. Jeremiah and others will have an uphill struggle to help them come to terms with their situation and accept God's purposes for them in exile. And there's no happy ending or resolution. The psalm just ends there. Exile sucks. This psalm is certainly not a model for our praying or our ethical reflection but we need its witness if we're to understand the misery of exile, a misery known by vast numbers of people in our world. We need to read this psalm in the context of the largest movement of displaced people in Europe since the Second World War and of millions of refugees across the globe. The inclusion of this vitriolic psalm in the scriptures does not imply approval of the exile's reactions, but it affirms that all human emotions can be brought into God's presence. And the poignant and unanswered question, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land, is one many followers of Jesus are now asking as the chill winds of post-Christendom blow through the threadbare vestiges of Christendom and reveal that we are also in exile, a minority community in an alien environment wondering where God is leading us. But this is not the last word on exile. To exiles like these, Jeremiah writes a pastoral letter, assuring them of God's continuing love and good purposes for them, but warning them not to believe the false prophets who predicted a quick return to Jerusalem. They're instead to learn how to live in Babylon, how to sing the Lord's song in a strange land, how to embrace exile. Many today are suggesting that there are similarities between the experience of Christians in post-Christendom and Israel's exile in Babylon, and that we can learn from Jeremiah's letter. Nobody is suggesting an exact parallel. 
there are significant differences, so we need to be careful not to push the analogy too far. One significant difference is that they were exiles in a foreign country, whereas we are resident exiles, struggling to come to terms with a changing culture. We haven't gone anywhere, but our culture has. But there are also some powerful, encouraging, and challenging commonalities, and Jeremiah's pastoral counsel resonates down the centuries. Let me name some of these commonalities. The Israelite exiles were not at home in their surroundings, but lived as a minority community in a society with very different religious beliefs, cultural norms, and social practices. This is the experience of Christians in post-Christendom. The exiles were struggling with a sense of loss and grief, wondering where God was in this new and uncongenial situation, hankering for the familiarities and certainties of the past. This is the experience of many Christians in post-Christendom. The exiles were wrestling with theological and ethical questions, unsure what they could legitimately embrace in Babylonian culture and what they must reject. We see that very clearly in the book of Daniel, that struggle to know where to draw the line. Christians in post-Christendom were wrestling with many theological, cultural and ethical issues. The exiles were facing the possibility of annihilation, not through annihilation by their enemies, but through losing heart becoming absorbed into an alien culture and losing hope. Many Christians in post-Christendom are experiencing loss of hope. Some denominations and some congregations see no future beyond the present generation. So what might we learn from Jeremiah's letter? Let me read a short part of chapter 29. It should be behind me. Yes. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Just imagine the exiles in Psalm 137 receiving that letter. <clears throat> this brief but potent prophetic letter contains reassurance, comfort, and encouragement, but also warnings, correctives, and challenges. And it offers a theological interpretation of exile that was radically different from how the exiles we encounter in Psalm 137 understood it. First, the warnings. Do not believe the false prophets who tell you that you will soon be going home that there's no need to adjust to life in exile, that God is about to intervene and change the situation. Just as there are climate change deniers, so there are post-Christendom deniers. Promising revival, offering quick fixes, peddling church growth programs, refusing to take seriously the challenges ahead. Post-Christendom is not a blip or a hiatus. There is no way back to Christendom. This is where we'll be spending the rest of our lives. Minority status is here to stay for the foreseeable future. A second warning, do not lose heart. Don't mope around feeling sorry for yourselves. Stop indulging in nostalgia and wishful thinking. There's work to do, life to be lived, community to build, missional purposes to be accomplished. Don't succumb to passivity or resignation. 
This is a time for patient and persistent rebuilding. In post-Christendom, our expectations must be realistic, not overinflated, and our time frame must be longer than we're used to, but we can make progress. Then the theological reframing of the situation. The exiles knew that Nebuchadnezzar had carried them into exile, but twice in this short letter, the Lord says through Jeremiah, I carried you into exile. The situation was not accidental or simply the result of geopolitical activity, but required a theological interpretation. Their God had not been defeated or sidelined, but was with them in exile and had purposes for them that only an exilic context could achieve. This was God's intention for that generation and the next. Exile was the result of judgment on unfaithful Israel, but it was also intended to be a period of refining, renewal, reorientation, and restoration. How do we interpret our situation theologically rather than just sociologically or pragmatically? Might post-Christendom represent divine judgment on the corruption and collusion of the Christendom era and an opportunity for refining, renewal, reorientation, and restoration? Jeremiah then sets out some very practical guidelines for the exiles if they're prepared to accept his theological reframing of their plight. How can they thrive in exile? First, put down roots. Learn to live in Babylon. Settle down. Stop hankering for the past or dreaming of a quick return to their homeland. Second, build for the future. Plant gardens, build houses, marry and have children, strengthen the community. These things will take time and represent investment in life in Babylon and in the next generation. They can experience growth in the community rather than decline. A pervasive feature of contemporary Western culture is an expectation of instant gratification. We live in an impatient culture. You ever watch that little thing going around in your computer, telling you it's doing something? You, know, you have to wait at least three or four seconds sometimes. It's awful. We want to see results quickly. And our churches can easily be infected by this cultural impatience. But one of the distinctive virtues of the pre-Christendom church was patience. A number of early theologians wrote treatises on this virtue. Post-Christendom require us to settle down, learn to live in a complex and changing culture, sow seeds and water them, have realistic expectations, build for the future, and invest in the next generation. Our churches have been declining for many years, and it's easy to think we could do nothing about that. But we can. We can take initiatives to sustain and extend our communities. Our minority Christian community may not increase dramatically, but we need not decrease. Then Jeremiah presents the exiles with a profound challenge. Seek the peace and prosperity. The word is shalom of Babylon. Stop resenting and hating those you blame for your situation. Stop dreaming of taking vengeance on them. Love your enemies and seek their highest good. This is radically different from what the exiles in Psalm 1 through 7 were praying for. Why should they do this? Because if Babylon prospers, so will the exiles. Their fortunes are intertwined with those of the Babylonians now. What might this mean in post-Christendom? Surely our churches are not full of people with murderous intent as they struggle to come to terms with the end of Christendom? Maybe not. But there's plenty of grief over declining numbers and diminished influence some blaming of those held responsible, the secularists, the media, members of other faith communities, and so on, and often more concern about institutional survival than the common good. Jeremiah might say to us that our primary vocation is to bless our post-Christendom society, to seek its good, to play our part humbly, graciously, non-defensively, and distinctively. We will not agree with all the values, priorities, or practices of our society, but we are called to engage with it, not to withdraw. This means seeking first the kingdom of God rather than the church. It means embracing a vision of social and cultural transformation rather than focusing on our own survival, our churches and our concerns. It means asking what shalom means in our cities, towns, and villages, 
and how we can bless secularists, hedonists, spiritual seekers, people of other faiths, anyone and everyone. It means turning outwards, not inwards. It means being truly missional in post-Christendom. And it means being unreservedly a people of peace, renouncing once and for all the Christendom practices of intolerance, manipulation and coercion. It was hard for the exiles in Babylon to believe that exile might be good for them. But that's what Jeremiah told them. God has led you into exile. God is at work among you. God plans a hopeful and prosperous future for you. Some 2,600 years later, looking back on Jeremiah's letter and the experiences of the Israelites in exile, we have the benefit of hindsight. We can't yet look back on our experience of post-Christendom. But we can see that exile was formative for the people of Israel. Their 70 years in Babylon was a time of profound spiritual renewal. After centuries of recurring idolatry, to which the Old Testament testifies unflinchingly, they finally discovered God was bigger than they'd ever imagined. Not just a tribal deity, but Lord of all the earth, with them in Babylon, as well as in their homeland. They thought they were God's favorites and looked down on others, but now they learn that God loves Babylonians too. When the Israelites finally returned from exile, the community was far from perfect and continued to exhibit ethnocentricity and religious superiority, but they no longer went after other gods. Something had changed, and it took 70 years. Their temple had been destroyed. The place they believed was God's special dwelling place, but they discovered that they could worship God anywhere. They no longer needed a sacred building. Many scholars trace the origin of the synagogue to the period of exile. Could we interpret this as a fresh expression of temple? When they returned from exile, they rebuilt the temple, but this was again destroyed. Over hundreds of years, the Jewish community has gathered in synagogues throughout the world. The foundations were laid in the exile period. And it seems that what we now know as the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures took shape in this period. Far from their homeland, the exiles collected and reflected on their oral traditions and writings that recalled their history and helped them make sense of their current situation. They reworked the liturgical resources, prophecies and wisdom literature to sustain their faith and distinctive identity in an alien environment. This theological editing process bequeathed an extraordinary legacy to future generations. So who knows what we might discover in post-Christendom if we hold our nerve trust in God's good purposes, settle down and seek shalom for our society. Christendom may be gone, but we might rediscover a more authentic way of being Christian, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of our society. Christians in different contexts and different generations are drawn to different parts of the biblical story. During the Christendom centuries, when church and state dominated a sacred society, it was natural to see parallels with the Israelite monarchy. Liberation theologians in oppressive contexts are drawn on the Exodus story as motif and inspiration. Christians under persecution were often encouraged by the book of Revelation. In the heady early days of the charismatic movement, the theme of restoration was central. But in post-Christendom, it may be the exilic literature that most powerfully resonates with our context. The exilic literature, I believe, offers us helpful resources for engaging with the realities of post-Christendom, its opportunities and its challenges. It offers us the language of lament, which many in our churches need as they grieve what has been lost. Psalm 137 may not be the ideal text for this. The Book of Lamentations and other exilic texts might be more appropriate. We need new songs and liturgies that better reflect our context, are less triumphalist, more suited to our minority status, more holistic, and inspire us to seek shalom in our world. I really do think we need a post-Christendom hymn book. The exilic literature offers us a fresh perspective on the activity and purposes of God, who is more interested in transformation than stability, and whose dream for creation and longing for all of humanity invites us to a much grander vision of mission in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. And the exilic literature offers us immensely practical guidelines for faithful discipleship as a minority community in a challenging environment. 
Jeremiah's letter is just a sample of what is on offer as we journey into post-Christendom and continue to ask how we can sing the Lord's song in this strange land. So, uh, there's a lot in that, wasn't there? Wow. So, uh, Stuart's kindly agreed to um, answer all your questions. <laughs> so, we have a microphone here. If you'd like to ask a question, just give you a moment or two to maybe think through maybe something you want to ask rather than, you know, just say it as it is. So, have a moment or two to think. And we'll take questions for the next 25 minutes max and then... If you want to join us for coffee afterwards um, in the cafe, we will do that also. So um, I'll pass you a microphone only because uh, we, are, we are streamed in other places. So it's good that if people um, can hear us with the question as well as the answers. So everyone is welcome to ask a question and Astro will happily um, respond accordingly. So if you want to ask a question, just put up your hand and I'll give you the microphone. Um, if not, we've got an early coffee. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, you talked at the end about a, a post-Christendom or a hymn book. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about any of the contemporary songs we use which are heading in what you might consider the right direction and... Um, maybe even some of the others. I freely confess that I'm not the slightest bit musical. And so I sort of know what I don't like, but I don't really know what I'm after, uh, which isn't very helpful, I know. Uh, I'm really hoping that others will take the lead in that and find the kinds of things that I think we need. I, I certainly am worried about the triumphalism of much of what we're seeing at present, which seems so unrealistic and so disconnected from our our culture. Um, I'm worried about the privatising of so much, the I language that seems to be dominant in so many of our songs, where I think we need much more of a, a community response. I'd love to see much more emphasis on social justice, more on creation, more, something more holistic altogether, really. Um, but because I'm not a musician, I'm not a songwriter, I don't really know quite what I'm striving for. I sort of, every so often, I, I hear one that I haven't heard before, I think, yes, that's the kind of thing. But, you know, I can't even remember what they are because I just don't do songs, really. Um, but, you know, with the title Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land, I really thought I ought to mention something about songs. Um, because I, I'm genuine and quite concerned that, you know, we are shaped by our, what we sing so much. And I just wonder what currently our songs are shaping us into. Uh, I think a lot of it's unrealistic stuff. I'd love to see more on the life of Jesus in our songs. I'd love to see more narrative songs, songs that tell the story, rather than a lot of kind of vague and waffly stuff. But I'm just playing my prejudices here. So, but if, if people have suggestions of genuinely post-Christendom songs, do shout them out or use the microphone, as Trevor has indicated. Or tell me afterwards, I'd be delighted. Stuart, there's a guitar there and maybe we could have a go, I don't know. If you want to ask a question, just put up your hand and I'll bring you the mic, thank you. Gary. Stuart, thank you. You talked about us continuing to be a minority community, and then you kind of softened and said, for the near future. Um, I'm, I'm a missionary. I'm hoping that we'll become a majority community again. Could, could you unpack that we're going to continue to be a minority community, at least for the near future? Yes, I don't see that as being in any way defeatist. I think that's a, a reading of the situation based on all the evidence that I've seen over many years. All the trends are pointing in the same direction. There are signs of hope, there are signs of growth in various places, but if you took the overall picture across Western society, however you measure the size of the Christian community, whether it's on belief, practice, attendance, membership, or whatever, they're all going in the same direction. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think what we may see is a kind of flattening out. I mean, there comes a point of decline where actually, if you're not going to hit ground zero in totally, things do have to flatten out. And I think we may see the level of decline flattening. But I don't see any real prospect of significant growth on the horizon. 
I mean, who knows? Um, but one of the questions that I'm um, asked quite often is what happens after post-Christendom? I've been asked recently to speak on post-post-Christendom, which feels to me a little bit like crystal ball gazing. I just don't know. And I could be entirely wrong. But I think there are a number of possibilities. I think we could see post-Christendom society becoming increasingly secular that the, the spirituality that I referred to earlier might just be something fairly superficial, and we're actually heading into a very, very secular future. It might be much more of a spiritual future, not necessarily Christian, but a kind of postmodern smorgasbord of religious and philosophical and spiritual stuff. That might be the way forward. It might be an increasingly Islamic society. Now, there are all kinds of possible scenarios, and one of those, of course, is it might become a more Christian society, that having tried a variety of other options, Western society eventually says, well, perhaps Christianity has something going for it after all. So I, I don't want to suggest that I know where it's, where it's going, what's going to happen, but I'm certainly not suggesting that we should just simply give up and watch ongoing decline. I think my main concern is about realistic expectations, that we don't buy into the narrative that says, if only we put this program in, into place and we have those kinds of fresh expressions and we do this, that and the other, we're going to see radical, rapid change. I just don't think that's on the agenda. And I'm not sure that's theologically how I read the situation. It seems to me that God has work to do with us as a minority community before we can be trusted to be a majority again. When we've been a majority community in the past, we've behaved pretty badly. We've mishandled power. We've oppressed other minorities. I just wonder whether we need a time in exile to begin to repent and renounce some of those things. It doesn't mean we couldn't ever be a majority again, but I hope we'd be a very different kind of majority. But, you know, my guess is as good as anybody else's. Oh, I, I, need, I need 19 microphones, although. I'm <laughs> um, just you know, keep your hands up when... Um, Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, could you help us distinguish um, between positive engagement with the city authorities um, and collusion, the dangers of collusion with power and status? I think we're moving into quite an interesting phase. I, I think until relatively recently, there's been enormous suspicion on both sides. There's been enormous suspicion of the church by various authorities, that um, the church wanting to be involved is really just a cover for proselytizing. You know, we may talk about wanting to serve our community or be involved in all kinds of good things, but actually what we're really looking for is an opportunity to evangelize. I think also there's been a huge suspicion on the other side of the authorities wanting to co-opt us, wanting to um, sh remove some of our distinctives and just push us into their particular way of working. That's not going to go away suddenly. I think that's, that's quite deep-rooted. But I do think there are increasingly good numbers now of examples where that's not happening, where there is genuine partnership and a willingness on both sides to face those suspicions honestly and to say, let's get beyond that. I think it's part of what I meant by this term post-secular. It seems there is a new opportunity emerging. And part of it is simply to do with an austerity culture. You know, the government simply cannot deliver on what it says is needed for a good society. So I think there'll be open doors for the church. And as long as we don't sell our birthright, I think we have real opportunities to, to, to follow through there. Yeah, I can do that if you like. I'm always wary of playing with these things because they fall apart. But OK, is that any better? Okay, this might be related to the question that was asked a minute ago. You mentioned very quickly in your introduction about the relative growth of churches in the global south, which seems to be in contrast to what we experience in the west. I appreciate they're very, very different cultures to ours, but are there things that we can learn from what the church is doing or what is happening there that might help us as we look forward? Yes, I think there are huge things we can learn, um, but I think we need to learn the right things. And there is danger, I think, of learning the wrong things if we're not very careful. So we have more missionaries coming to the West than going from the West now. That's been known for quite some time. And one of the challenges facing those who come from, from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia as missionaries, is how do they find a way of engaging with 
post-Christendom Western people. By and large, they have been pretty effective at reaching out to their own diaspora. Uh, very effective in some cases, but with very, very few exceptions, unable to break out beyond that. So I have, over the years, had lots of conversations, particularly with West African church leaders, who have built successful West African churches, who long to reach out beyond that. Now, this, this is not their strategy. That's not what they wanted. They want to reach everybody in the community, but they don't know how. And they ask the question, why don't they come? Why can't we reach them? Why aren't they responding? Why aren't they responding like our own constituency does? Um, and there's a, a, a learning that needs to happen in terms of how do we engage with the post-Christendom world. And part of the difficulty is that many of them bring with them a kind of Christendom Christianity that we exported three or four generations ago and which they think is authentic Christianity. And so there's a, a difficult kind of learning process that needs to happen. I'm not hopeful that first generation leaders from the global south are going to be able to make that transition. But I see second and third generation leaders, those particularly who were uh, brought up in the UK who are bicultural, uh, well able to do that. And I think we could see some interesting and encouraging developments as we move forward. That might actually be one of the most significant missional developments in the next couple of generations. If these vibrant, faith-filled, spiritual communities can find ways of contextualizing and breaking out of their own environment, that could be a game changer. You know, that might be a further response to Gary's question. What could make a real difference? Actually moving us from decline to growth. Well, that may be one of those possibilities. But we just need to be careful we learn the right things. There was a wonderful gathering of African church leaders in London several years ago now, uh, when <clears throat> I think it was the London Baptist Association invited uh, leaders of growing African Baptist churches, and they're booming in London. Um, come and tell us what you're doing right. What can we learn? And each of the leaders was given an opportunity just to say what they thought. And a variety of things were suggested. There was just one thing that all, all of them, without exception, agreed on. That the key thing for effective church growth, and you can sense people writing this down, robed choirs. <laughs> That'll bring them in. And you sort of saw the pencil stop. <laughs> and I don't doubt that in that... It, see, that's a problem if I move this. I don't doubt that in that context, robed choirs meant something. But I just can't believe that's the key strategy for a post-Christendom missiology. So it, it's what we learn and how... But it, there needs to be humility about it. The danger is that we think, well, you know, these West African missions, they don't know what to do. Let's try and tell them what they need to do. It needs to be different from that. That's just post-colonial again. We need to find ways of learning together, I think. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, you said something about being in a post-Christendom setting, uh, the church can still make, I think you said make progress. And I just wondered if you might tell us what you have in mind. I, th I think I'm thinking too, we've used words like growth um, and also about being outwardly focused and not inward. And yet it does, I just wonder whether some of that progress is also about who we are and what we look like. Maybe there is a kind of inward or deepening necessary. And I just wondered if you might break that down for us a bit more. Thank you. Yeah, but by being outward focused, I don't mean that we give no attention to the inward things. Of course, we need to do that. And there's something about the quality of our relationships that, that matters hugely. Um, I think there is every prospect of what you might call ordinary churches, finding a way to grow, not dramatically, but bit by bit, simply through the quality of their life together. I think it's important we don't give up on ordinary church life because the vast majority of churches, if we're honest, are quite ordinary. You know, they're not funky. They're not hugely progressive. They're not all singing or dancing. They're ordinary, but the ordinariness can actually be quite attractive. A piece of work that was done a few years ago um, contrasted the, the view of the local church in the community with the view of the church as an institution. And it's quite interesting. It was a little bit similar to what you find when you ask people what they think of the NHS as compared with what they think of the local hospital. 
And by and large, people have all sorts of criticisms of the NHS, but they speak in glowing terms of their local hospital and the treatment they received. And there was an argument really from this piece of research that said, well, let's stop worrying about the church as a whole. Let's focus on the integrity and the attractiveness in the right sense of the local church. Let's just get on with it. I think that's part of it. I also think there's something going on under the radar at the moment. And I, I just don't know how significant it is, but I've become aware over the last two or three years of a, a, a huge number of very small, very local neighborhood initiatives, which are not connected to any institution, which do not want to be co-opted in any way, but are just looking to be good news in their streets. I think there are lots and lots of those around. And they are largely under the radar. They're just not, we're not picking them up, really. I remember talking to the leaders of the Fresh Expressions movement about 18 months ago and saying, are you aware of what's going on? And they weren't at all. But it's interesting that in a number of our cities in particular, we're seeing these very small, very local, very unpretentious initiatives. I would sort of wonder, I've been wondering for a few years, are we going to see a second wave of, of emerging churches? Do you remember the term emerging church of 10 years or so ago? I'm not quite sure what happened to that, but I just wonder whether something new is emerging, a kind of second wave. And if that's the case, then that might be part of my response, because by and large, these are groups that are genuinely seeking the common good. They're seeking shalom for their society, and I think it's quite encouraging. But they don't actually feature on any of the um, measuring scales at the moment. And so we may actually be growing in ways we don't know, which could be quite encouraging. I don't want to big it up too much. It, you know, it's fragile. It, it might come to nothing. But I just think it's interesting. A colleague of mine uh, in a northern city, oh, I'm in the north here, aren't I? I'm from Canterbury. I always think of anything sort of beyond Nottingham's north. But in a, in a genuinely northern city, a colleague of mine found 50 such groups in one city. And the denominational leaders knew nothing about them. Something's going on. Thank you, Stuart. Well, I think uh, what you, your your work on um, post Christendom resonates, I think, with 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 all of us to some degree. My concern, uh, and, and what I, what I teach on really, is the um, influence and the effect that another missionary faith, which is well resourced, and uh, some would say was in revival, um, will have upon the church in this country. I wonder what comments you might have. Guess. <laughs> yes, I think that's a very real uh, issue in post-Christendom. We are in a contested world. There is no um, neutral place. There is no quiet zone, if you like. I think there are all kinds of interesting questions facing the Islamic community, which I assume you're referring to. There is no doubt that there is significant growth, although the numbers involved are generally far smaller than most people think. Um, another piece of quite amusing research, really, is where you compare um, what people think is the size of the Islamic community with what actually the size is. And it's ridiculously different. Nevertheless, there is growth, and the growth is taking place uh, for a number of reasons. It's taking place partly through birth rate, that the higher birth rate is increasing the size of the Muslim community, uh, partly through uh, conversion growth. Westerners are becoming Muslims. Much of that is because of marriage. It's Westerners marrying Muslims and converting to Islam. But for others, it's a genuine religious conversion as well. Um, so that's, that's a reality that we're facing. I think the unknowns, unknown uh, dimension for me is what happens as Islam gets secularized. What happens as Islam butts up against the secular values of the West and second or third generation Muslims find themselves in that kind of uncertainty as what happens. So while we grapple with the issues of post-Christendom, I was at a conference a few years ago where there was a similar conversation going on about um, how Muslims cope with being in a post-Islamic situation, being in a minority culture. So there are dynamics in both communities, I think. So again, I don't know. Um, I mean, the figures seem to suggest that by the year 2050, there'll be more active mosque worshippers than Christians in churches. That, that 
seems to be the kind of tipping point in terms of numbers. But what that means in practice, I'm not sure. And there is the issue of nominality in the Islamic world as there is in the Christian world. So it's a long way of saying I haven't got a clue. It's time for one or two more questions. So I think Kelly Murray had a shot. You mentioned that we're becoming a, a minority. Um, and the way I see the society today, uh, we've seen examples of um, the, sorry, um, the way we get, when we identify ourselves as Christians and say something that is not popular in secular culture, we tend to get shot down. Um, do, we have, do you have any like suggestions how we can circumnavigate that? Because it, it just seems as if we, we're, we're scared of expressing ourselves as Christians because, for fear of upsetting the general public. Yeah, I guess a number of comments. <coughs> Sometimes I've heard people describe that sort of scenario as persecution. And I think we've just got to be very, very wary of using that sort of language. You haven't used it, but I've heard people using that. Um, I'm not allowed to wear a cross at work. Oh, that's persecution. I just don't think that's helpful language. In the light of uh, a global church, which is genuinely experiencing real persecution, I think the slight discomfort or embarrassment or disappointment is not persecution. So I think we've got to be very careful how we um, weigh up some of those things. I think, <clears throat> in part, it is the legacy of Christendom that means we are there to be shot at. So you know, the, the phrase you've, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard many times, they'd never dare say about Muhammad what they say about Jesus on the radio, that, that kind of thing. Well, no, they wouldn't, because Islam is still perceived as a, a minority community, whereas Christianity is perceived as, a, as an ex-majority minority, and therefore um, it's OK to have a pop at us. I just think we need to be big enough not to be too worried about it. You know, I think it's really quite important that we don't overplay that, that we don't become belligerent and angry and resentful about it. I think it's, let's, let's just accept that as simply part of being a minority in an alien culture. And I think it's really important what tone of voice we use. So I'm not suggesting in any way that we back away from talking about our faith or presenting Christian views on certain things. But I think there are ways of saying it. And the danger, I think, is that we still find many of the Christian spokespersons speaking as if they were representing a majority. And there's an arrogance and there's, there's a tone of voice which I think irritates people. So I think the way we say things is going to be really quite important. Um, thanks very much, Stuart. Um, it's an A and a B. Uh, you talked under exilic literature about practical guidelines for faithful discipleship. And then sort of connected to that, you mentioned in passing an early theologians uh, that did treaties on uh, patience. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, talking about. He's talking about the need for patience. He's talking about giving up on short-term expectations and radical sudden change. He seems to me to be asking the exiles to invest in the longer term, you know, a, a, a two-generation strategy effectively. And <clears throat> patience seems to be one of the virtues that the early church thought quite a lot about. Uh, so there are uh, treatises by people like Tertullian and Cyprian and later on Augustine writing specifically about patience and commending this as a Christian virtue and linking patience with faith. So a church can be patient if it genuinely trusts God. Impatience is often a sign we don't really trust God. We feel we've somehow got to do God's work for God. I think there's something about that which is really quite important. And it seems to me one of the opportunities, as well as the challenges of post-Christendom, is that we're now living out of control. So Christendom was a control mechanism. Christendom was a long period when the church tried to control history, controlled what people believed, controlled how they behaved, controlled the institutions they belonged to, tried to control the outcomes of history. And it ultimately didn't work. And we now live out of control. And that gives us, I think, an opportunity to uh, renew faith in God and to exhibit something of this patience. So that, that was the kind of connection I was trying to make. And I'm intrigued by the 
uh, extent to which the early church seemed to think patience was really important. Leave it to me, yeah. Uh, so there is a table of books um, at the back that Stuart has offered or co-offered being part of. Um, there is a price list there, which means they can't be taken, but they can be bought. <laughs> um, if you'd like to buy a book and uh, you could see Stuart or see myself, if that's okay with you, Stuart, is that okay? I'll take a 10% cut and uh, I'll pass that on for sure. So there's a range of um, books that relate to our themes uh, today and also um, uh, they're kind of accessible at different levels. There's a, a range of levels and a range of um, ideas and titles to maybe have a look at on the way out the door. Um, thank you, Stuart, for being with us. He hasn't felt so well today, so I'm really glad that he's been able to come from Canterbury and, and give us the lecture. Please express our thanks to your wife also. Um, we are going to have some tea and coffee and refreshments um, next door. We'd love you to stay and uh, continue on the discussion with one another. And uh, I think it's just um, my responsibility to say thank you again to Stuart for coming and giving us this very stimulating and thought-provoking lecture with lots of questions that we need to work through together as a Christian community um, in our current culture. And with Stuart, we journey on that and we trust God who is with us. And thank you all for coming from different places. For those who are watching through live streaming, thank you for um, joining us um, online. And for those who are present in the room, again, thank you for being with us today. Um, coffee is served. Thank you, Stuart. <clears throat>